I want to thank everybody for coming to today's Grand Rounds and welcome everybody. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Marco Costa. He's the Director of the Interventional Cardiovascular Center and the Director of Research and Innovation at the Harrington McLaughlin Heart and Vascular Institute here at the University Medical Center. Dr. Costa received his MD from Federal University of Minas Gerais, Brazil, and his PhD in Interventional Cardiology and from, from Erasmus University in Rotterdam, Netherlands. He completed fellowships in both basic science and vascular medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation and interventional cardiology at Felicio Quasho Hospital in Brazil and Netherlands. Dr. Costo's area of expertise are in vascular and cell biology, cardiovascular imaging, and interventional cardiovascular medicine. He has been the leading investigator in several clinical trials on gene and stem cell therapy, as well as the national principal investigator of numerous stent clinical trials. He was one of the pioneers who, together with Dr. Eduardo uh, Souza, first treated patients with PCIs um, with drug-looting stents. He has also established a world-class center of excellence in optical coherence tomography in collaboration with the Case Med Biomedical Engineering and Center of Biophotonics. We're extremely lucky and grateful to have him speak today. Please join me in giving Dr. Costa a warm welcome as our presenter today at Grant Rounds, discussing recent advances in the treatment of aortic valve stenosis. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you for your nice introduction. I, it always amazes me how difficult it is to say something in Portuguese uh, for foreigners, but you did a very good job. Uh, the, I have been here before. It's a pleasure and an honor to be a member of this faculty. Most of you might know my background. We work a lot on imaging, and usually my uh, lectures are very imaging-oriented and fleshy, but today I kind of try to tune it down and be a little bit more of a clinician. Uh, than just the interventional cardiology, which is basically a pomba uh, in the cat lab. Uh, the, the things that we're going to address today uh, in the topics are pretty much we're going to go to understand a little bit about the etiology very briefly, as well as the epidemiology of this disease, which has become much more, much more common um, for you. If you're an intern in this hospital, you appreciate that we have more and more of these patients uh, in our units. Then we're going to go uh, one single slide on physical examination. I think we should never underestimate the value of proper uh, medicine and bedside uh, mm -hmm. examination for these patients. And obviously, we're going to talk about how we stratify this disease is not so simple as it appears. And finally, we're going to talk about the prognosis. And obviously, the main focus of this lecture will be the invasive new therapies. Um, as you know, up to this moment, uh, a aortic valve through surgical um, approaches are the center of care. So we are here exploring new areas and new avenues, and we're going to discuss with you some recent updates, particularly that came from the European Society of Cardiology meeting uh, recently. So let's get started with the etiology. So if you have a normal aortic heart valve, that is how it should look. In a tree lifet, there is no thickening and this would function. However, if you have one of these three conditions, one is congenital bicuspid or aortic valve, which is the most common presentation is aortic stenosis at least. Patients usually present a little bit earlier than the other most common form, at least in the United States, of aortic stenosis, which is the senile uh, degenerative calcific aortic stenosis. The bicuspid valve has a a little bit different presentation and is at this point still new advances uh, because the disease is not solely involving the valve itself but it's a disease of the aorta and for that you need surgical approach to be able to correct this disease um, in full spectrum. Now if you look at senile or senile aortic stenosis it's truly really flat and sometimes it's very difficult for a to distinguish between the two because the, the curatomy uh, may have fusion and it's very difficult to differentiate this part, particular type of disease from that. Um, patients with multiple image modalities we're going to discuss later so to facilitate the distinguishing because the treatment options are a little bit different. And obviously um, where I come from, um, uh, South America, we have a lot and one of the very, very common offered you know, zeromatic, or it's also very difficult to differentiate these two causes because this might also be a late presentation of the process. So that being said, 
Uh, this slide I put it specific for my colleague Mukesh Jain, who would not let me speak about a disease process in the aortic valve without talking about the pathophysiology and mechanisms. The mechanisms are not so much different from the mechanisms of arterial sclerosis as you have known. But the central process is actually inflammation leading by monocytes and macrophage. It's believed that endothelial denudation with high shear stress, this high velocity of flow in the aortic leaflet, associated with the low shear stress in the abluminal or the opposite side of the vessel where you have the turbulent flow uh, in the other side of the valve make create conditions that promote uh, upper regulation of inflammatory markers and other markers and, and transcriptive factors um, thickening of the valve and later deposits of calcification very similar to our so we are here, uh, very fortunate from a scientific and research perspective to have a number of these patients as the population ages. This is the uh, prevalence of the disease. As you can see, it increases with uh, uh, the older the patients and the older the population, the more patients we're going to see. And we have seen this over the past five years. I can tell you that during my training as an interventional cardiologist, I have treated a lot of patients with balloon valvuloplasty in the old times. And the frequency of patients that we see every day, at least here, uh, it's certainly uh, drastic compared to what my experience has been in the past. And this shows you that there is a high frequency of aortic valve pathology already present in patients that are six, five years and older. Almost a quarter, uh, almost two quarters of those patients, or half of those people put together, 40% have some sort of disease. What is a problematic of this, of this graphic is that these patients are at high risk for events. Uh, whether sclerosis of the aortic valve is a marker of advanced arterial sclerosis disease, or it's a leading uh, uh, disease that's gonna prevent, lead patients to have aortic stenosis is still unclear. What we know is that 40% of these patients, if they live longer, if they don't die for other types of uh, causes, they will develop severe heart stenosis and we end up. So it's a very high number of patients that when they find to have sclerosis, have to be carefully monitored over the subsequent years of their lives. So one of the things that is interesting to me as an interventional cardiologist is that I see these patients a lot in the cath lab. And most of them have this angina symptoms. They have exertional chest pain. Uh, uh, it's, it's been very difficult to, to, de to decipher what exactly is the mechanism. It's just because of myocardial hypertrophy and there is not enough demand or decreasing flow during diastasis because of hypertrophy. But the truth is we didn't have much of the information until very recently these colleagues, which is actually not published yet, have your sensors and a pressure sensor into the coronaries before they did the topic procedures. You can't do that in the OR. So now this procedure is done in the cat lab or in the hybrid ORs. You use all these interventional tools. So they put this catheter. So it's what they call is the ability of the valve in patients with normal valves, but is always decreased in patients with uh, lower valves. So they did this very nice mapping. I'm not going to spend time, but the reason is that there is a couple of mechanisms so when you exercise or you demand some uh, more flow of using any drugs to increase contra compression, so you also have increased microvascular suction, and therefore you increase coronary pressure. pressure. Diastolic pressure decreases, so you decrease coronary flow, and you lose some of your suction. So very interesting reading uh, happening to these patients. Why do they have uh, chest pain? Why do they come with the with this? But the most important uh, risk stratification uh, tool that we have it's a very simple and elegant tool. It's the echocardiogram. So here you have a transesophageal echocardiogram. I select, we don't do this routinely, but I select this case because it gives you a very good perspective of the three leaflets of the valve and the port opening of this valve and the amount of calcification, which is those bright spots that you see there. We actually measure flow velocities and we define gradients throughout to the measurements uh, that are observed here. So echocardiogram is your first step towards defining a patient severity of the disease and obviously stratification because you're going to not only be looking at the valve but you're going to be looking at left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, left, left atrial size, 
uh, you can look at rhythms and other concomitant abnormalities. You're going to be looking at the mitral valve. So there's a lot of things that you need to think about, not only the valve itself, but other uh, factors that ultrasound is going to uh, help you to define. A diagnosis of port stenosis, unfortunately, is not in the cat lab. Patients that come to the cat lab should have the diagnosis and the process are established. That's just a stop to either go for a surgical procedures or when these metrics are not clear. And what's the nat natural history of this process? Well, there are a lot of things that can happen to those patients. Most of them remain asymptomatic for a long period of time. Some of them develop the typical symptoms. You know, angina, sing, a, um, not associated with that. Also, a, a, a higher chance of the develop arrhythmias, both uh, ventricular tachycardia. One important aspect of these patients, and I, I, and I'm sure Alan may, may give us more insights on this because he's been doing uh, dealing with these patients for a long time. We are holding on these patients a little bit longer. They have severe coronary disease. They have peripheral disease. They have had previous surgeries. They have placement, and it's really difficult to distinguish what's the cause of their symptoms a more definitive therapy for that patient. But what we know now, regardless of their comorbidities, is that if we don't activate the treatment, which the only way to fix that mechanical problem is by replacing the valve, this patient is going to die, and it's going to die very quickly. So here's what happens. 33% of the elderly patients that are seen by cardiologists or primary care physicians are held back. They're not referred for open heart surgery. And this is old data on a time that only have open heart surgery. Maybe people are fearful of some of this data. Actually, the data here in this hospital is way much better than that. But this is just some of the statistics that might be in the minds of many of you. Patients that are much older has much higher mortality. We actually do not have much data on patients that are older than 85 and 90 years old of age because our STS database doesn't really uh, have enough numbers of those patients. But the problem is that we might be thinking about some of these uh, difficulties that might have, maybe not in this hospital, but in other places. Uh, some of these numbers are accurate. So people are holding these patients because they're very sick. And there's another problem. Some of these patients do not present with the classic high gradient, high uh, velocities, and small valve areas. They have what they call low gradient severe arc stenosis. What is interesting is that these patients also are at high risk. There is a huge controversy now because we're seeing more, many more of those patients in our clinics, and in the clinical trial, it's been very difficult to decide where and how. Uh, to include those patients. Mm -hmm. And this is a very interesting study that I would recommend you to look. Uh, it's an editorial that describes the morphologic change in those patients. And it's very easy to decide where or not to act on those patients. One of the ways to do it is by stress test. And we can do this in the echocardiogram laboratory by the butamine stress test. It's very safe. And we can, if you really true AS with low gradient. What happened to many of these patients that you can notice in this slide they have small cavities. So when you do your classic ejection fraction, which is the classic number that everybody uses, patients have normal ejection fraction. But the stroke volume through this valve is much less. So the, the heart cannot accommodate too much volume. It ejects a good fraction, but it's not enough. So then you got low velocities and you got low gradients. And that's the major problem. And then things progress. Things get even worse. And you have this problem. When you do a vasodilatation or increase the inotropic effect with the butamine, you're going to have these patients here who develop significant gradients compared to others that really have true moderate aortic stenosis. Here's what happens if you don't treat those patients. They have much worse prognosis. They call paradoxical low uh, gradient. Uh, this was first described by Hashira. And this has been now very much in debate. So the, the, case is, the case is not closed yet. There's a lot to be discussed about how to address patients. But we believe strongly that these patients should be treated uh, uh, aggressively. And how do we stratify the patients? So I'm just giving you a snapshot of actually a true case that we did here at University Hospitals. We have what they call the STS score. The STS score was not really designed for a specific forwarding uh, stenosis. The STS, STS score is stratified to look at operative risk mortality. There are a number of variables that take into account. And you can see that most pertinent variables, chronic disease, diabetes, age, at this age, there is not checked much data in the STS score. So this patient actually is a little bit off, and it doesn't get the benefit of being that but what the STS score doesn't take into account is a number of other accounts. What is the lung capacity to the actual risk? Even the STS score, if you look at most of the recent data, our numbers and many other uh, centers of excellence in this type of rates at one year is 
And here's where we get to, I think, I hope, the highlight of the program. Uh, we still have 30 minutes to go, and I want to share with you some of the developments that we have. So uh, this is our early uh, day, most of these. So we're not here to discuss about the surgical approach uh, uh, today. What we're here to talk about is what happens over the past. developed the first a valve. Uh, he had to go to the pulmonary um, venous system across the right atrium, transept over, and get access to the left atrium, cross the mitral valve, make a U-turn, cross into the aortic valve, and deploy his first valve. So as you see, we the cardiologist is a very brave and innovative, uh, and, and he didn't do that in France. He did that in South America. So you understand uh, why they might go somewhere else to do those kind of procedures. But, but we have to think that this innovation is what led us to where we are today. So if we're not that aggressive and innovative uh, as interventional cardiologists, we would not have revolution. Clinical trials have been developed, and this continues to ongo. But I think it's – and you can't really expect much of the data that you have for aortic valve replacement. So still today, aortic valve replacement remains your uh, main stand uh, therapy. There are two main types of valves that are pertinent to the U.S. population. One of them is the Edwards. Uh, called, uh, Edwards is the company. The valve is called Sapien. We have discussed that uh, with internal medicine residents uh, recently. There has been the first many studies, as you see, small patient population that have been developed, have been presented, have been published. The results were outstanding. And therefore, they have moved on into European experience and more recently into the U.S. for what they call pivotal clinical trials that allow us to approve this technology for treating our patients in the United States. Here are the different shapes and forms of these valves. This is the core valve. We're going to go in much more details. Uh, the sapien valve is actually not shown here, but we're going to show you in the next slide. So those are the two valves that we're going to be using. The SADRA is coming very quickly. Uh, we know it's fully approved, and the decision to treat a patient with aortic stenosis is pretty much left to the heart team. And the heart team is usually composed by interventional cardiologist, a cardiac surgeon, and a general cardiologist. In our case, this is represented by Dr. Markovitz, this is represented by myself, and then Simon, and Dr. Jim Fang. So we get together, and if we were in Europe, and decide whether this patient goes to this procedure, procedure, giving some of the insights that we have gained from the clinical trials. But remember, there were no randomized clinical trials performed in Europe. Most of the insights that have been gained were through registries, large volume registries, but still registers like this one. So here we have already 3,000 that has been treated since 2010 in Europe. And you can see it by the slope of this curve that this is going fast. About 190 new patients per month are treated uh, in France in a few centers, not in, in many, not all centers still activate in this protocol. Here's what happened in Germany. So I just picked the two major uh, um, centers uh, for this procedure. In Germany, and they divide, this is the surgical group and the interventional, as you know, and what is interesting to see is that the, the availability of uh, TAVI in Germany actually has helped make a major increase in the volume of surgical procedures. And I think this is what we are seeing here. Most of these patients don't qualify for a TAVI, and we have seen that these patients need treatment. So we end up actually uh, increasing our volume, and probably we're going to see this more as we get more advanced in our program, uh, by just having the availability and the options for those patients because then you're not sitting this patient in the office and let them die without a proper treatment. But this is interesting. There is actually a, a very fat gain, and you can see that there is a major uh, shift in the way they're doing uh, this procedure in Germany. Here's what we need to consider. So we discuss a lot about the clinical aspects of the disease. So patients develop symptoms. We have to think about how to treat them. Now we need to talk about what are anatomical considerations. Can we do this in everybody? And the answer is no, we can't do this for every single patient. Actually, we do this for actually a small minority of patients because many of them do not qualify to what we call the anatomical considerations or criteria. Five valves, they are first generation. They have limited size. This has been expanded this year. There are new sizes that are available in Europe, but in the United States we are still restricted by the size of this. Well, we have a valve that's 29 millimeters in diameter, and we don't have this 31 millimeters in diameter, and we have one that's 26. 
And here are some of the endless diameters, the coronary circulation with the prostatic valve. So all these things that we do, and we have to take them into account. Myself, I don't keep those numbers in mind because I think it's a waste of my I, um, brain uh, to try to decorate this. But the, the truth is, these numbers are critical because we really need to be precise on the application of this technology. Here's how we are doing. Uh, this is actually one of our patients. We are using CT angiogram to evaluate uh, the annulus of the aortic valve properly. We can measure this in two uh, frames. Uh, what is interesting that we're learning more and more what Dr. Markovitz and other cardiac surgeons knew is that the aortic valve is not a circular structure. It's more an elliptical structure. And usually there is a larger diameter and it's actually more one of the most circular uh, valves that we have seen so far in our program. And whilst we are measuring now the perimeter, because we know that when our valve is expanded, the perimeter is actually going to matter if you're going to be really opposed and preventing paravalvular leaks. This is what we are also using CT for. I think CT scan is becoming a very, very regular tool for us, uh, both to evaluate the valve, but also to evaluate the access site. So we look at the subiclavians, and we look at the tortuosities, we look at calcification, and we look at sizes. And we have to do this comprehensive assessment because we need to decide which approach we're going to take and what's the best approach for our patients. Here is what we are today. We have had the conclusion of what they call partner trial in the United States. This trial has two arms, the high-risk population, which is when the patient is deemed to have high-risk features based on the STS score, more than 10% predictive mortality. These patients will randomize to either open heart surgery or to TAVI. TAVI could be done in this trial either transfemoral through the femoral arteries or transapically through a cut down, which I call more like a surgical procedure. Uh, and these patients were randomized. On the other arm, which has been published earlier, and I'm going to share with you some results, and this is a very important arm for us to understand the natural history of this, uh, to understand whether or not Dr. Brown and Ross were right in 1968 when they predict such a um, drastic outcome for those patients that develop symptoms. The patients that were deemed not operable, too high risk uh, for surgery, they were randomized to medical therapy, which doesn't exist, but that's what they were in. Uh, the FDA mandated this randomization and uh, versus uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. However, many of us may think that this is unethical, uh, but the truth is, up to this moment, we didn't know if there was equipoise or any difference between these two treatment arms. And I think this is a very important study that's not going to be replicated ever, but it was important for us to learn what is the problem. This is the, the original publication. I think this is the major publication in the United States. Uh, it's groundbreaking. And this is what we found. The mortality rates were 50.7% of patients over a period of one year when they didn't get treatment. So and remember, most of these patients, 30, a third of these patients actually end up having some sort of treatment, which is the balloon valvuloplasty. Something that we do here, but it's just a temporizing procedure. But because these patients have no operative chance, we, they could not bridge them to surgery or even switch them to the active arm. So patients died. And one of the debates were balloon valvuloplasty doesn't work. The truth is that when you stratify the population that got balloon valvuloplasty versus the population that did not even get balloon valvuloplasty, the mortality rate is even higher. So therefore, indeed, balloon valvuloplasty actually helped a little bit the natural history, which is not natural history because we already did a procedure on these patients, to decrease this to 50%. Otherwise, you'd be talking about 60 to 70% mortality rate for these patients if nothing was done. So it's a very dreadful uh, disease, and you have to act fast. The line, the slope is very quick. Obviously, these patients are inoperable. They are, have multiple comorbidities, and they are very high risk. So there will be a high incidence of that over the period of one year in these patients. No question. When you look at cardiovascular mortality, same trends are observed. So actually, 10%, if I go back, 10% of this is actually non-cardiac, which would be expected. But there is 20% that these patients have developed advanced heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, or other comorbidities, arrhythmias, that might be associated with cardiovascular mortality. But almost everything that you see in the death rates on the patients on the medical group are actually cardiac. So if we don't fix the valve, this patient is going to die from their heart. If you fix it, 
10% of them will die from other causes, but it is really preventing uh, mortality and preventing death for these patients. Here's the clinical outcomes for uh, these patients. I'll just move to the next slide, which I think is more pertinent. So now here we talk about the cohort A. So it's the second uh, part of this trial, which is comparing aortic valve replacement by surgical means versus transcutaneous or transapical approach. So this is the two groups. You can see that the outcomes, which the outcomes mortality at one year is absolutely identical uh, between the two groups. There were no difference in mortality uh, 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 that we could identify in this trial. So therefore, the trial meet the non-inferior pre-specified margin and was considered to be a successful trial when, for the test and hypothesis. But the, the one thing that this trial also allowed is for us to understand the nuances of approaches. So there are many ways we interventional cardiologists and surgeons can get to the heart. So one of the ways are the trans-subiclavian access, which Dr. Markovitz is one of the pioneers of this technique, and actually we have I reported one of the uh, new ways to do this procedure, and I'm going to show you a case uh, in a minute. And also the most common for us interventional cardiologists, the transfemoral. And actually, as we get more experience, it appears that this route is the easiest, the most comfortable, even for uh, cardiac surgeons and anesthesiologists that work with us in the lab. This route is probably going to be require some adaptations of the technology because it was really designed to be a transfemoral. But certainly is a great alternative and a great access for patients. This has been successful, uh, to my surprise and to the surprise of many, including Dr. Markovitz. So when you look at the outcomes, and I just want to focus your attention to this early six months, you can see that there's a much uh, larger uh, discrepancy in the outcomes of these patients with a trend towards TAVR, which is the transcatheter, uh, being superior. This is a trend, it's just a hypothesis. But I'd like you to focus your attention to this curve and then you see now, so this is the apical approach. So if you're doing this procedure from the lag as a regular heart procedure, first of all, you already pre-select your population because these patients have better vessels. You can grow to the groin. They're bigger patients. So that's one can have yet. But the other one is a much more natural approach and much more controllable approach than going to the transapical. So the transapical approach inherits all the potential complications that you might have during your open heart surgery. And not only that, you're not with the heart open access to the patient. Um, here in Cleveland, I'm concerned when patients go outside the window if that valve is going to collapse. But in <laughs> Portugal, in Florida, where I come from, or Brazil, we don't have that concern. So here, you, here is the, the whole picture. And what's interesting about this procedure's time, you can see what we see uh, in the lab. Uh, many years, surgeons recorded videos, and we have, have difficulties to understand the anatomical leg procedure. From the leg, you have this catheter in the ascending aorta. This is the descending aorta. This is a peak detail because of the shape of the catheter, the valve plane. This is the heart. You can see the calcification, the mitral valve. This is the calcification of the lungs. As you can see, this is a very calcified patient. They are old. So at the same time, we put a pacemaker because we're going to do this with a balloon tip. We're going to do this to a, a as the, we, we diminish the power of the ventricle that trying valve as we're trying to inflate in the aortic valve. This is actually new techniques that we have been using and has been very successful also for balloon valvuloplasty. So we have a cat, another wire that's coming from the subclavian to that ventricle. Here's, we're trying to advance this valve. So that's the big long prosthesis. We are going to the ventricle. We're going a little fast. It get tangled a little bit in the pigtail. We're going to correct that. I see, show you. Uh, we use that pigtail to take pictures. You can see the aortic valve, the arch, the positioning of this valve. You want to position two of those crowns below the valve. Um, this is done in a very controllable fashion. What's interesting about this valve compared to the sapien valve is that the other one you have just one time. You inflate the balloon, and you pray that it's in the right place. So that valve has a very steep, very slow uh, learning curve, and there is a lot of depth that goes along the way when you implement that program in your center. Uh, the core valve is very forgiving. So I have total control of this valve through these little clips there. I am just taking pictures, and I continue to do that throughout the procedure. Uh, here is the valve as it's being deployed. So let's, let's see if you can play it again. It's actually pulling this back, and it's going to release. 
and this valve is deployed. And this is the result. This is a CT scan that we do on those patients. Uh, we have a study in Portugal that we are following up these patients with CT scan serially. Uh, this is the valve in a cross-section of veal, and this is your new valve and the coronaries that are circulated. So that's why the coronary sign is important that you have this extra room here to treat those patients. It is a very cool procedure. And, and as I said to you, the learning curve for this is very simple. Even uh, Markovitz and I can do this safely. 98%, if you're now experienced, go to 98, and if you're more experienced, remains 98. So there is no really much difference between the results that we're gonna get here or we're getting here. Although we are very experienced in the center, I have done more 30 of these procedures, 25 abroad, and 11 cases here, and we have been very successful. For American standards, we have the largest experience in TAV in the, in the country. Here is the mortality rate, a, a, a finite number of patients. Uh, the 30-day mortality is very acceptable. Remember, these are patients that are uh, very sick and inoperable. This is a list of all different publication operators in Europe, comparing Mediterranean Corvop and Edward Sapien. And you can see that there is a little discrepancy in numbers based on accuracy of data, based on expertise, based on the heart team approach. But essentially, you can go anywhere from 6% to 15% 30-day mortality, depends on your population. Some updates, as I mentioned to you, the France study before. What I find interesting in this is that in France, 75% of these procedures are performed in a regular cath lab. That's definitely not our approach here. We have anesthesia, imaging team, vascular surgery, cardiac surgery, interventional cardiology, and cardiology for the success of these procedures. And we perform, we are one of those 15% of the groups that do have a super nice hybrid operating room that we can perform this safely. Uh, this is the mortality risk. Uh, it's interesting in France that they have ac access to both technologies. They use both liberally, and they have very good outcomes in this population. This is the results. One of the things that I don't want to leave here without talking to you about is the need for pacemaker. Actually, our electrophysiology colleagues are happy we're doing this because 20% of those cases will require a pacemaker. Uh, this is actually a very good number. This number can go up to 30, depending on your population. And this is more a specific problem of the valve that actually we are using here, although it's safer. It does have that requirement. We actually put a pacemaker on a patient today that we treated last week. Um, the Edwards have less problems, but this is not a, uh, the requirement of pacemaker is also not uh, minimal for patients that have a uh, replacement through surgical means. So it's, it's a problem. It's a problem of this population, and we have to learn and improve this in the future. Another major problem is the stroke rates, which is still around the 4%. We'd like this to be zero. Uh, we know the risk for strokes. So this is the four years so for, for us that uh, do well. So this is the early experience. I have here all my friends and uh, former mentors, Patrick uh, Rubio, who lives in Brazil now. I think uh, it's unfortunate or fortunate that I live in the United States now. I'm not part of this. But the, the early experience now that has been compiled of all these patients show a 70% that it's a, some error here. It's a 70% survival, not cardiac death survival, but survival patients that die from other causes that see that there is actually uh, endothelization in some of the body. The risk of thrombosis is, is minimal. We have not seen fractures, which was one of the concerns because of them on these valves. And we don't see any structural valve deterioration up to four years. So this is a very, very interesting report. Other thing is that most of the strokes occur earlier, so we don't see any embolization or formation of clot on top of this valve later on in the development. This is early data. We need much more data to be definitive. This is our fine design. Uh, thankfully, the FDA eliminated the optimal, I would say, the suboptimal medical therapy. We are everybody that's extreme risk that Dr. Markovitz field is not appropriate for surgery uh, receives a TAVI, receives a transcatheter valve. So it's and if they qualify for the very strict criteria, the high risk surgical groups, which the 10% uh, cutoff from the STS database, are actually randomized between surgery versus uh, TAVI. This is the list of, of of criteria. It's extensive. I don't want you to. Think about it. I just want you to think about that these patients need some treatment. And if you don't believe so, if you've been spending this last 50 minutes here, um, ask, me, ask yourself, these are 90 plus year old patients. Why should our healthcare system pay for this procedure? That's a normal question. And I think the reason why I think we do this is this example. This is our patient. He's 90 year old, uh, Dr. Jim Fang's patient, who came for us. And he is a volunteer. He dances and sings, and he couldn't do this no longer. And this patient couldn't live his life. So 90s, we have to go through a six-month process of getting ready for this procedure. And he, after a month after he got the procedure, he got this award. 
So if you want to get an award, just come talk to us. We can give you a vow. This is the team, as I mentioned many times, is a multidisciplinary, it's not a small team. Sometimes it's chaotic. We have to deal with a number of different uh, coordinations and schedules and time. Uh, as you see, Dr. Markovitz, the center stage of this process. I thank you for your attention. There is Dr. Vic Keshap, if you have not met yet. And obviously, the picture that Dan and I like the most is this one, when we have Dr. Markovitz in the middle. Thank you very much for your attention.